So they're uh, moving and coming out front and sitting with you and, and all those things, so I don't have to remember to keep looking backwards. And Sorry, Glenn, I probably not, won't look back at you very often. Sunday after Easter, we began a series on discipleship, on what it means to be a disciple, and today we are bringing that to a close, but we are also beginning the next series, which I don't really have a name for, you're just going to have to keep coming to figure it out, and that's okay, because you all are pretty smart. We've been talking about how discipleship is the simple following of Jesus Christ. I didn't necessarily say easy. I said simple. It's about following the leader, about following our Lord, following the master. And, and we've done all kinds of great learning here. We, we, we started out talking about how if, if, if you know you're a Christian, you're also a disciple. And if you're a disciple, you know you are a Okay, good. Y'all did that better than the first service this morning. First service, this side got it right, and this side looked at me like they'd never heard it before. And the visitors were actually on that side. <laughs> but, you know, if it was really that simple, if it was really that easy, I wouldn't have to preach about being a disciple. And Quite frankly, one of the ongoing themes in, in the book of Acts and in, in, in the scripture is how to be a better disciple. How to live life more fully as a follower of Jesus. And, and we, we have these wonderful people in scripture that, that show us what it means to be a disciple. And, and today as we move from this series into the next, we're going to Spend one more day with that um, ever wonderful, perfect in every way disciple named Peter. You know, he, he, he is the epitome of human disciple. Because he can get it right in one minute and blow it in the next. Any of you identify with that? Yeah. So Peter, Peter, it seems, should know better. And who in this room hasn't said that to somebody else, especially our children? You should know better than that. Maybe you do say it to yourself. I should know better than this. I do. Oh, yeah. I do know better than this. So, being a disciple. I was thinking about Peter. And you know, Peter sometimes, quite frankly, just blows it. From the very beginning, Luke chapter 2 and then Luke, or 3 and then 5 and 8, Peter keeps showing up. And Jesus keeps saying, Peter, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And he had to do that twice. It's like he didn't get it the first time. Well, that's okay. Let's give him some grace. How many of us get everything right the first time? But the second time you would think Peter, of all people, has gotten it right. And sure enough, he's got it right for about a chapter. And then life happens. Any of you ever get bombarded by life once in a while? Life happens and weird things change. Things that we never thought would ever change. So Peter, bless his heart. He's blessed. Because Jesus calls his disciples together one day. And he says, hey, 
I'm doing an informal poll. I need to know what people are saying about me. Who do people say that I am? He says, and, and you know, the, the, the disciples, they give all kinds of answers. They say, oh, they think you're John the Baptist, come back to life, or Elijah, or one of the other prophets, or, or this person, or that person. Then, Jesus I says, thinks, I, I, I think with a smile, he looks at him and says, but who do you you say that I am. And it's Peter that jumps. I think he jumps to his feet and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You're the one that's sent to save the world. And Jesus says, you got it, Peter. You're right. And on that rock, I'm going to build my church. And everybody applauds for Peter, right? Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> until the next chapter when they get ready to go to Jerusalem so Jesus can actually do all of the things that he just said and Peter comes to him and says oh Lord don't go to Jerusalem they want to kill you there and Jesus looks at him and says get thee behind me Satan whoops from really good guy hero to Satan. That's a big change. Then they come to the Lord's table. They're having this last meal, and, and Jesus stands up with the really bad news of the day. He says, again, one of you, as he looks at all of them, is going to betray me. And they all react in this abject horror. Oh no, who? Not me, not me. And Peter, most vainly of all, stands, Lord, I will follow you even if it means to die. And Jesus just shakes his head and says, Peter, if you only knew, if you only knew that before the cock crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. says, I got this. I'll never do that. But we all know what happened. We all know that in that chapter, they go out after the Last Supper. They go up on Golgotha. Jesus takes his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John, to go just a little bit higher up on the mountain to pray. And he says to them, wait here and pray, and I'm going up here. See, that's the problem. They let him get away. So he goes up and prays, and he comes back, and guess what? Those three favorite disciples of, of, of Jesus, his three closest friends, they could not pray, Jesus says, for yet even an hour. So there they are, asleep. And at that point, the betrayer comes. And we think Peter's going to jump to the rescue once again. We know how Peter is. He reaches over, he grabs his sword, and this is where we find out he's really a fisherman. Because he takes a mighty swing, and he cuts the ear off of the high priest's servant. The ear. Jesus says, put that away. <laughs> and he heals the man. And then they go off to the trial, and, and Scripture tells us that the apostles followed at a distance because, you know, they didn't want to get too close. And they're in the courtyard, and, and once more, Peter is given the opportunity to be the solid rock, but this servant girl, this nobody, this person who has no authority, can't be a witness, has no real investment, looks at Peter and says, 
Oh, aren't you one of the followers of Jesus? And Peter goes, Not me, I don't even know him. Just one. Not too long after that, another servant girl looks at him and says, Oh, that's Peter, he's with him. Aren't you Peter with them, with Jesus? Don't you, aren't you one of his followers? And Not me, I don't know the man, I never met him. Getting pretty close to that rooster. Then, one last slave looks at him and says, you were one of his followers, your very accent gives you away. You don't know what you're saying, he says. Scripture says he used curse words. I've never met the man. I don't know him. I am not one of his followers. And the rooster crowed. Now, I don't know about you, but, well, actually, I do know a lot about you all. <laughs> and I know that most of you are thinking a little bit like me, and, you know, it's baseball season, and three strikes, and you are. And it's not just been three strikes for Peter. If you go through and you count up all the strikes, he went for the cycle, oh, for four. So we think he's done, right? Herein is the good, bestest news of all. No matter how often you screw it up, no matter how often you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, Jesus says, I'm not done with you yet. And it's true. I know that to be true because he's not done with me. And he's not done with you. Or with you. He's not. He keeps calling us back into his midst. He keeps calling us to be his disciples. He keeps calling us to follow him. He keeps calling us to be his disciples. Even when we should be down and out, he says, come back. Lift up your commitment. Grow in your commitment. Grow in your discipleship. Grow in your faith. Become who I need you to be. For you see, he wasn't done with Peter that day either. Because after the resurrection... We meet them one last time. In that second chapter of Acts, we meet Peter. He's in the upper room with his disciples. They've been praying and they've been waiting and they've been ready to claim the promise of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit comes. The one they've been waiting for. The power source the very power of God. And it comes in with a mighty rushing wind, the sound of, and fire like tongues from heaven fall on each one of them, and, and they begin to speak the good news, and they begin to preach and teach about the love of God and about how the kingdom of God is at hand and how their lives are going to be changed because of their commitment to Jesus. And they spoke with such fervor that every person in Jerusalem, no matter what language they spoke, no matter what their heritage was, no matter where they were from, no matter who they were, they heard the good news in their language. And 
And that's the call. That's the purpose of Pentecost in the church. For there are people in our world who need to hear the Word of God in their language. And guess what, folks? You speak it. You have the words of hope and love. You have the words of grace and mercy. You have the hands that can serve and the feet that can move. You have it. And the Holy Spirit is coming for you to put it to work. I love the fact that when I said that, three eyes looked up to heaven saying, I wonder if it's coming. My friends, Peter could have given up. James and John, the other disciples, could have given up. Jesus could have given up on them, but he didn't. And that's because the call to discipleship is a call to commitment. And a call to commitment goes beyond these doors and beyond these walls and beyond these hearts in this room. So today, we're going to move from discipleship to commitment. Because commitment's taking one more step. Commitment is going one step further. Commitment is touching one more life. Commitment is hugging one more sinner who's just like us. Commitment is answering the call to be the disciple Jesus has called us to be. For six weeks, I've been giving you three things to do when you leave this place. Today, you're going to think it's a vacation. There's only two. There are two things we need you to do. The first is easy. The first is to pull out your calendars, your whiteboards, your refrigerators, and to put a date on it. That date is June 12th. What date? June 12th. And on that day, you were called to be in church. It's Sunday, by the way. Just thought I'd tell you. But it's going to be a Sunday unlike one we've seen in years at First Christian Church. It's going to be a Sunday about commitment. It's going to be a Sunday that's going to change the life of the church. It's going to be a Sunday that tells us that God is blessing us and moving us in a great direction. And so, like I told the first service, I'm sorry, if you're planning vacation on June 12th, cancel it. Sure you can. Because something more important is happening that day in this place. I know it sounds really cold for me to say that. But I've got news for you. This is really important. June 12th. You all need to be here. Secondly, I'm going to ask you, I need some help. Can you uh, hand some of these out? And Walt, would you hand some of these out? Everybody needs a green card. Um, Isabel, can you do me a favor and hand out cards on this side of the room? Just pass them down and... We are asking you to do something really important for June 12th. By the way, if you were at the first service, you don't have to fill out a card, but it'll show extra commitment if you do. Yeah, I did. You didn't get one at the first service, you did. 
That day is so important, I am asking for people to commit themselves to pray every day between now and June 12th for that day. To pray that we are blessed that day, to pray that people show up that day, to pray that the food is great that day. By the way, there will be food. And I know you're reading. This is your covenant to pray. Put your name on it. If you're willing to pray, you're going to hand these cards on your way out to Joe and Glenn at the door. I've also instructed Joe and Glenn not to let you out without one. Joe and Glenn or Joe or Glenn? That's how important it is. The commitment to pray for June 12th is a commitment to pray for the change in our lives as a church, a faith body, and a world. Your world. And on that first Pentecost day, that's what happened. The world changed because God spoke. Amen.